All right, welcome back again to the afternoon, uh, the rest of the afternoon sessions. Uh, we are very pleased to have uh, Becky and Steve here to talk about uh, honeybees in general and, and beekeeping basics. Uh, and they have a long and storied career uh, in, in <laughs> beekeeping and, and lots of education in Kansas. So we really appreciate them taking time for us. Uh, yeah, take it away. Oh, thank you, Ryan. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, I hate to say that we're old beekeepers, but we're old beekeepers. So we've, we've been at this a long time. Uh, I'll, I, I, people always seem to be interested in how did you get started story. And our how did you get started story was, I've always been a gardener and I, just the interest in honeybees was there. It was like, oh, this is this is uh, pollination and the bees and they make honey and I love honey. And so I read books and I talked to a cousin that had bees down in the Ozarks and yada, yada, yada. And I think Steve decided one Christmas it was time to for me to put up or shut up. And he bought me a beginning beehive kit for Christmas, which is kind of a sucker deal. You get sucked into that and then it's it's that's all. But I really have to say, not many of us receive Christmas gifts that change our lives. And that was a gift that changed my life, changed everything. And so now this is Steve, I'm Becky, we're Country Creek Honey, Meriden, Kansas, which is in the extreme Northeast part of the state. And we have kept bees for approaching 35 years, somewhere around there. So let's see if we can get this show moving. All right, then that didn't wanna work. There we go. Why bees? Well, this was the question that my family said to me when I said I'm going to keep bees they were like really you know why would you want to do that well this is why a third of our food depends upon insect pollination 20 billion dollars is attributed to ag of ag revenue is attributed to pollination by the honeybees and if you look worldwide it's more like 200 billion we only produce about a fourth of the honey we consume in the US and the rest of it is imported. We like honey, but we don't produce anywhere near enough. And if you look at the list of adulterated products, honey is like number three. So if you buy honey off of your grocery store shelf, the chances are you're probably getting honey and something else like corn sweetener. Uh, so honey has tremendous value. In most of the world, honey isn't a sweet treat, a condiment, a, a, a sweetener for your food. It's medicine. It just is that valuable. The beeswax is valuable. The honey is tremendously valuable. There are more species of honeybees today than the sum total of all mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and birds. 17,000 species of bees have been described, but perhaps another 10,000 await discovery. So Sarah is going to be out there in Oregon and she's gonna find a new bee. I know she is, she's just that kind of person. We'll call it the Sarah Red Bee. So I hope that that happens, but that's why I did bees. So to understand beekeeping, and I, I think that I'm, I hope, I'm not just preaching to the choir here that there are people here that are considering beekeeping and these are some of your considerations. Um, it, it, is, it is not for everybody, but it is applied bee biology. That's where I wanted to go with this. It is understanding how the bees work. And if you understand how they work, then you will become a better beekeeper. So we're gonna go over biology to begin with. And so back to your biology class, they are from the kingdom animalia. They are animals, they're arthropods. They have those jointed appendages. They're an in insect, hymenoptera, all those things with stingers, wasps and bees and all that. The family Apidae refers to bees. And of course we are talking about Apis, Apis mellifera is the bee with flowers. And so this family apidae of bees, they have plumosa body hairs. Their hairs are like little feather dusters and they carry pollen from plant to plant. Bees and flowering plants evolved at almost the exact same time, very symbiotic relationship. Our bees are 
flower feeders. And if there's anything that's more fun than taking pictures of bees on flowers, I'm not quite sure what it is. They take advantage of the blossoms and the more blossoms, as has been pointed out, the better off they are, the more nutrition that's available to them. Some people, and we haven't really talked about this a lot, but in, it has been talked about in literature a lot, um, question whether honeybees are a detriment or a benefit to our native pollinators. We plant for all bees. We plant, I have a lot of plants that the honeybees don't visit, but the bumblebees do because they can utilize different flowers. We have several plants that are very bee specific that only one single bee can pollinate them and it isn't a honeybee. You can find literature that supports both points of view. The honeybee is a detriment to native bees because there is finite resources and those honeybees are using them up. And of course our honeybee is a non-native bee to, the, to North America. You can also find literature that talks about where an area has been devastated. It uh, no longer has diverse floral sources available, won't support native bees. When it won't support native bees, they just leave. They die out, they leave, they whatever, but native bees are gone from an area when there aren't the flowers there to support it. So if it is regenerated, if it is reseeded, if it is, um, you work to bring back those richer native lands, you can bring in the honeybee and they can be used to pollinate that, to regenerate it, to make it so that it will be a climate, an area that is inviting for our native pollinators again. So I can argue that both ways, I have seen it argued both ways, but we're gonna talk about our honeybees and supporting them because they are needed, flower feeders. So their protein is pollen. And as was already said, the more diverse their diet, the healthier our bees are. They have probably one of the most diverse diets on our planet because they will utilize just so many different pollens and it makes them healthier. Honey is their carbohydrate. A average colony of bees will produce that's a good number, 700 pounds of honey in a year. Yes, that's the truth, but most of it is consumed by them during brood rearing processes. That's what honey is, it's their food. So a beekeeper here in Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, might get to keep 10% of that harvest. I think our considered our average is something between 50 and 70 pounds per hive, and that's that would, that's a good harvest. So we have, like I said, lots of kinds of bees. And this picture, I like this picture of this honeybee upper left because she has propolis on her back legs. That clear looks like a fluid. Of course, bumblebees, which are wonderful, wonderful pollinators. They're so big, they're so strong. They've got those wonderful flight muscles. They can do uh, buzz pollination, really important for those flowers that have tightly held pollen. We have orchard bees, we have bees specializing for our cucumbers and melons. And along this line, we sometimes see in literature refer to races of honeybees, races of Apis mellifera, Italians, Caucasians, Carniolans, Russians, little black German bees, Africanized bees, and then there's some hybrid traits that are really offshoots of all of these. Long time ago, it was the Midnight Starline lines. Now we do Varroa sensitive hygienic and um, Sazcatraz is one of the newest ones that I've seen come out, but they are bred from some of these lines. Once upon a time, they were defined by geographic reasons The they didn't cross the mountains. And on this side of the mountains, they were a little lighter. And on this side of the mountains, they were a little darker. They may have special adaptations such as their tongues might be longer to allow them to access down into a flower better. The size of their comb 
cell might be a little bit different. So their colorations are different. And of course, then there is their defensiveness. If you've come, if you've had any work with Africanized bees, they are um, incredibly defensive. But if you lived in Africa, there might be a lot of things that wanted to eat your honey. So being defensive is important. We've been interested in honeybees for years and years and years. This is from a children's textbook, 1873. Looks like those kids were learning a lot of stuff about honeybees. Historically, we know that we have interacted with bees for thousands of years. The picture upper left is from Valencia, Spain, 15,000 years ago, and that is a honey hunter. And if you get on the internet and look at the Nepal honey hunters today, it doesn't look a whole lot different. They are still climbing vines and ropes and trying to steal honey from the bees. And uh, there are some brave people that do that. So as I said, honey is not native to, uh, honey bees are not native to North America. They came on our very first ships and they came because the honey was so prized. And as I said, it wasn't for that it's a sweet treat, it really is for medicinal purposes, sore throats and wounds and burns and things like that. In the upper right-hand corner is actually a market where they're selling bees. And those are of course the skeps that they would put bees in. That is primitive beekeeping, destruction beekeeping. When it's time to harvest that honey, they tip the skep, smoke it really good with their smoking pipe and cut out whatever combs that they think that they can harvest. Destroying the colony was not really a concern because they knew they could catch more the next spring, that they're just they were very abundant. Honeybees were very, very prolific. And even here in the United States where they were non-native, they spread rapidly. The hive that is in the lower right side is called a gum and it's made from a hollow log. And of course, that's one of the favorite places for honeybees to build a nest. Our honeybees are a very social organism. In fact, they're called eusocial. They communicate by pheromones, they share food, which is called trophallaxis, and is how they stay alive during the winter. They have a reproductive division of labor. Not everybody does everything. Caste system, the females, we have the queen and the worker, separate castes. There is cooperative care of young. These are not my babies or your babies. They're the babies that we take care of. And each larva is probably visited something around 2,000 times before it's capped over. That's a lot of visits. Overlapping generations take care of that, and we'll talk more about that later, about the jobs of the worker bees. And they have elaborate and defended nests. And so it doesn't matter which of the bees that you're talking about, that is something that's very consistent with the bee that makes honey. There are several bees that make honey, more than just Apis mellifera. And throughout the world, the different places, they still have these characteristics in common. So here are our casts, our cast of characters. The queen bee, long, slim abdomen, her thorax doesn't have anywhere near as much hair on it as our worker bee. She is the sexually complete female of the hive. She is the egg layer. That is her primary job, although she does have other important work to do. The worker bee is the one who does just everything else that needs to be done in the hive. She is about a third smaller than the queen, pretty fuzzy, very agile, just such an amazing, amazing creature. And both of them develop from a fertilized egg. Then there's the drone. He develops from an unfertilized egg. He has huge eyes. He has a big thorax. He has strong flight muscles. He is, develops from the unfertilized egg. And he does almost nothing else except that one important job for males. And that is he lives to fertilize a queen, to mate with a queen. That is his job. He doesn't collect nectar. He doesn't even have a stinger. So picking him up and watching him buzz, sometimes it's kind of entertaining. 
So let's talk more about the queen. She is the reproductive female and her other job besides laying eggs and she can lay as many as 1500 eggs in a day, that is a tremendous number, is that she produces pheromones that keep the hive together. Her pheromones do things like contribute to the retinue behavior. It keeps the worker bees all around her. Her pheromone inhibits the rearing of replacement queens. As long as her pheromone is strong and present, they won't begin rearing another queen for the hive. In mating, her pheromone acts as a sexual attractant to, to the drones. In a swarm, her pheromone is a stabilization chemical. It keeps the hive together. Sometimes a hive will swarm without a queen. That's not a good situation, but it does. And sometimes they just kind of break apart and go back to the hive because they can't quite get their act together. It stimulates foraging, brood rearing, and it also works as a hormone to suppress ovary development in worker bees. Worker bees have ovaries. Worker bees are capable of laying eggs, but not in a healthy hive. So here is our big drone, as I said, just male, and his job is mate with new virgin queens. And of course, not from his hive. His hive had a queen in it that laid the eggs that he is uh, developing from. He will fly out and he mates with other queens from other hives. Now they found, they thought for a while that drones are big and they just eat a lot. And why should we have them in our hives? Let's cut them out because beekeepers have done tremendously stupid things over the years, but we did that anyway. And they found out that hives without drones were really not as productive as hives with drones and that they thought that drones probably contribute to the normalcy of the hive. And so leave those drones alone. A healthy hive will raise drones. And that's um, a good sign that things are ready to move on in spring. So the worker bees. The worker bees are amazing creatures. They are sexually incomplete. And in the first three weeks, they work inside the hive. They are the hive bees and they clean out the cells, nurse the other bees, feed them. They ripen nectar and they store the honey. They pack pollen into the cells. They secrete wax and they act as guards for the hive. They actually have a plethora of jobs that are divided up into a few days or maybe a week or so for each job. Here is that chart. I think this is one of the best things about Zoom. You can actually see this chart. When I do this in a big room, nobody knows what this chart's saying. So let's look at this. If you look at, um, at the top of this chart, like about the fifth item down is wax glands. The wax glands kick in on about day three after the bee has hatched out of her cell after she's emerged. And the wax glands are very active from about day three over here to about day 20. Now that doesn't mean that when she's older that she still can't secrete some wax, but this is the time where she will spend building cells and doing all the things that are needed for beeswax. Because of course beeswax cells are the holder for the baby bees and holder for the honey and for the pollen and everything happens in the cell. Now, if we go down here, to feeding the queen. That happens on, it looks like about day four or five. That is a very specific time when grooming the queen, feeding the queen is an activity that that young bee will participate in. And then she doesn't, she has other things to do. So those bees that you see in the retinue around your queen four, five days old, and that's it. And then they move on and do something else. So every hive in the co in the colony doesn't every, in the colony. every every bee in the colony. Thank you. Doesn't have the opportunity to feed the queen. But that queen pheromone is so important that those bees that feed the queen, touch the queen, groom the queen, will then touch another bee, and then touch another bee, 
and that pheromone spreads throughout the hive. So it's an incredibly important job. If there's a breakdown in that and that job doesn't happen, maybe the clumsy beekeeper kills that queen. Within 15 minutes, that pheromone is not being distributed throughout the hive and the whole hive knows that their queen is gone and they will start taking steps immediately to replace her. So at about three weeks of age, the worker bee takes her orientation flight and then she becomes a field bee. She'll collect nectar, pollen, propolis, and water. And she is from then on a field bee. She only lives in the summertime about six weeks. If you find an old bee, you'll know she's an old bee because her wings are tattered and she, her, she isn't near as fuzzy as the new bees because she just works herself to death. That, that's the worker bee. This is another um, screen that I like on the computer better than I did in the big room because you can see the development of the larva. It starts off as an egg and on day one as an egg, it stands very erect in the bottom of the cell. On day two, it'll lay at a 45 degree angle. Day three, it lays in the bottom and it emerges. Actually, the outside coating of the egg dissolves and you have the larval stage. There are five larval stages for the that they will go through until it's ready to stretch out in the cell and pupate. This is complete metamorphosis. So the bee goes through all stages, egg, egg larval pupa emerges as an adult. And this is the amount of time that that takes. And I always was surprised that our queen because of being fed so much royal jelly, and that's such a powerful brood food, she is going to develop first and emerge first in about 16, 15, 16 days. And that depends a little bit on the race of bees. Africanized bees emerge before European honeybees, which is pretty funny. All of them, queen, worker, drone, spend three days as an egg, as a larva, six as a worker, six and a half is a drone, and then they cap them over and they pupate, drones taking the longest. This is an important fact that has led to a lot of the research um, or been important impacted the research on varroa mites, which is pretty much public enemy number one for the bees. The Varroa mite discovered that, I guess, I don't know how to say that without being anthropomorphic, that they can develop more mites in drone brood because they are in the cell longer. And so utilizing drone brood is one of the ways that we can control some varroa mites without chemicals, that longer time to develop. So queens develop in a vertical cell. It usually hangs down from the face of the comb. Drones and workers are in horizontal cells. The drone is the unfertilized egg and the queen larva receives only royal jelly and she receives more than she can eat. She will be floating in royal jelly when there is that opportunity, when there is good food sources available. The food is what determines those differences. So in honeybee anatomy, just like all insects, honeybees have three body parts, head, thorax, abdomen, three pairs of legs. Um, they have some amazing antenna that have such great sensory capacity. That's like a whole talk on antennas right there. They have two pair of membrane-like wings that actually hook together with tiny, tiny hooks called hamuli. So like all arthropods, they have the same characteristics, that exoskeleton, open circulatory system, and, you know, just what you would expect from an insect. This looks at uh, kind of their body parts in a drawing that's easier to see. They have two compound eyes that don't necessarily see the same way we see things. They believe that their color spectrum is a little different than ours and that they don't see uh, white particularly well. I don't know why, how they just, I'm sorry? It's red. Red, well, why do we wear oh. white suits? Okay, okay. 
Steve's talking to me. That's okay. We do that. And that's, you know what? In fact, I didn't say this. If you were going to do one thing to make your beekeeping experience better, find a beekeeping partner, somebody to do this with, because this is a fun hobby to be able to talk over different situations. So besides their compound eyes, they have three little eyes up here on the very top of their head that are called ocelli. If you think about where a bee does her work inside the hive, it's dark. And they think these little ocelli are help them navigate around inside the hive. We talked about the antenna. Their mandibles are what they use to chew the little wax flakes. The wax is from their abdomens down here. Choose the wax flakes into hexagons so that it makes the hexagon shape. Did you know that bees can make hexagons in space? That that's not anything that's taught from generation to generation. It isn't a taught skill at all. It's innate. And if they take them into space and Great. They took them up there and they still made hexagons. Their proboscis is that long tongue that they stick down into the nectaries to draw out the nectar. Here is their wings, their little wing hooks, and here's their sphericals. This is where they breathe on the side of their body. And if you hold a queen bee in your hand, by the way, the queen bee will not sting you if you hold her in your hand. She has a stinger that's a very sharp, pointy stinger, and it's very effective. It doesn't have a barb on the end like our worker bee stingers, so the queen bee could sting you multiple times, or the queen bee can sting multiple times, but she won't sting you because you're not a queen bee, and that's not what her stinger is for. But if you hold her very tightly in your hand, you can block these little sphericals and she'll actually faint. So don't hold her too tightly in your hand. That's not a good thing. But if you kind of breathe on her and let her get some air again, she'll probably perk back up. So one of the things about our very eusocial honeybees is their ability to communicate. They have a sort of language. A guy named Von Frisch discovered the basics of their dance language uh, nearly a hundred years ago. And even school kids know a bee can find a food source, she'll return to the hive, and she will do a dance that will tell her sisters where it is, how far, and by the vigor of her dance, how good it is. They have discovered new things about the dance language nearly every year. It's like somebody has discovered something new. Now we know that there's variations on it. This is mostly Tom Seeley's work that is, um, I'm trying to think of what word he used for that. It's like a call to action dance and they will actually go up to other bees and give them a little shove and it's like, get busy. Come on, we've got stuff to do and uh, gets them into their moving mode. On the face of the swarm, when this, this is a wonderful bee swarm here, there will be worker bees on the face. Well, they're scout bees and they have been out looking for a location for a new home and they dance on the face of this. And as they dance, they communicate with others where they want to go and where they think would be the best home. So let's talk a little bit about the pheromones. Each of the bees produces her own, his own set of pheromones. As I said, retinue behavior, uh, it inhibits the, replace, the rearing of replacement queens, a sexual attraction, swarm stabilizer, all of those things um, are part of the queen pheromone. Workers have a pheromone as well. The one that they probably use the most is an orientation pheromone. It's called um, the Nazanoff gland, which is located right here on the tip of the tail. In a swarm situation or when you are hiving bees, you'll notice this particularly. She'll put her head down, her rump in the air, expose this gland, and then fan like crazy with her wings. And she's sending out a scent plume that tells other bees, this is where our home is. This is where we're going to be. And they can orient on that and they will come into the hive. This is the chemical for that Nazanoff scent. The worker also has a couple of other pheromones. One of them is called a footprint pheromone. If they have visited a flower, 
they will leave behind a pheromone that says, I've been here. It's a pretty short duration pheromone, but it lets other bees know so they don't bother going to that flower and trying to get nectar out of it. Nope, I've already been here. You don't need to come in. There's an alarm pheromone. If something is bothering the hive, she will they will emit this alarm pheromone. And this is a pheromone that you can smell, kind of a banana pledgy smell. I don't know, it's, it's a very distinctive smell, but it is a call to action for the other bees to our hive is being attacked in some way. And even if it's you, the beekeeper, it's the same alarm pheromone. That's why smokers use, or that's why beekeepers use a smoker because it will mask that alarm pheromone. And then if the bees are not aroused, you can work the hive pretty easily without getting stung. One of the other pheromones that is a worker pheromone is called a target pheromone. And when the bee stings, whether it's you or the bear or whatever, this target pheromone is left behind and it tells the other bees, this is a vulnerable spot. So the last thing she does after her stinger pulls out and she is destined to die is that she leaves a marker behind that tells the others, and here's the spot where you can sting this critter to and uh, protect our hive. So very altruistic kind of thing, but that makes sense. In a big hairy bear, there aren't very many exposed areas that would be easy to sting. And so having that target pheromone lets them hone in on exactly the right spot. Swarming, hmm, swarming is asexual reproduction of the hive. Hives, bees reproduce sexually, egg, lay the egg, the bee develops. But if the hive gets too big and that queen pheromone isn't being distributed throughout the hive as it should be, they will perceive that they are too crowded and they will make preparations to divide. Part of that is that the queen will lay a fertilized egg in a cup and they will begin growing replacement queens. They're going to swarm. So the colony is huge and on the day that they have capped cells or just about that time, the swarm will probably emerge. They emerge generally before your capped queen cell and this is the queen cell, this peanutty looking thing up here and you can see it's got a cap on the end. Usually a swarm will emerge between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. They prefer good weather. Before that, one of those unusual dances occurs. It's called a whirring dance, and it is kind of a call to action that says, let's go. There may be some queen pipping, but mostly it is that whirring dance. And there's kind of a division, a random division. It'll be more older bees. It can be as many as 75% of the bees leave. We know it's usually at least 50% of the bees leave the parent colony and they're going to cluster nearby, not really very far at all from the parent colony. How far is it from the parent colony? I don't remember. It's usually not... within 25 yards. So pretty close. So if you find a swarm, you might look around for the parent colony. They're gonna stay hanging in that first location, maybe a few minutes, but maybe a few days and they are scouting to find the new home. They are dancing on that cluster, as I mentioned before, and then they will move in mass to their new home. And they are going to start colony life anew. They are loaded for bear. They've eaten a lot of honey. They're ready to build wax like crazy. The beekeeper can take advantage of that swarm situation by putting them in a box with some new foundation. They will be great wax producers for you. So in the parent colony, that new virgin queen is emerging. And you can see on these queen cells, these have all been either chewed out or the queen has chewed out here. This perfect little round circle shows the sign that the queen has emerged. And yes, they will likely fight to the death. If they didn't kill this queen in the cell, they will fight once they get out. Usually one queen per hive. Now they, 
there is some research that suggests that in as much as 20% of our hives, we may have a second queen, but they think that those are usually mother-daughter pairs, not two sisters. So three to five days after that queen emerges, she's going to take her orientation flight. That's just a quick buzz around to kind of figure out where she's at and what's going on. The next day after that, she will take what's known as a nuptial flight. That's a mating flight. And she will do that on successive days, sometimes between the fifth and the 14th day after she emerged. The weather greatly impacts her ability to do these mating flights. Too much wind, not going to happen. Raining, not going to happen. Wow, what a critical time for the hive. We have an unmated queen. We don't have another queen. We probably don't have any eggs in there because that queen that left, she quit laying eggs three or four days before she took off. No eggs, no other queen. This virgin queen is the whole hopes for this parent colony to be successful. So this virgin queen is going to leave the hive on one of her nuptial flights. She's going to fly through what's known as a drone congregation area, a DCA. This picture on the right is a queen in a little cage and the bees that you see around her are all drones that are going like come out, come out, we want you. She's being floated by an air, by an, a weather balloon. And if you look carefully, oh, you guys probably can't see it, but there is a string that you can just barely see there. The weather balloon is out of the picture. This was a grad student at the University of Nebraska looking for drone congregation areas. And I would love to have a grad student to do little things like this. She just walked around and did this little thing. So the queen will mate with one to seven drones on one to three mating flights. She is then mated for life. This is, as I said, a scary time to be a queen because while she's out doing this, all of the purple martins in the world are smacking their little bird lips going tasty all kinds of ways that she can be damaged, be destroyed, never make it back to the hive. And she has to make it back mated. A queen that isn't well mated will not survive in the hive as well. The hive will be doomed if she doesn't have a spermatheca full of sperm and it will be lots and lots and lots. She should last four years but that may not happen. We know that some of the chemicals that we've talked about today are both shortening the lives of our queens and making our drones less fertile, that those exposures, especially to things like fungicides, are really uh, impacting that. So back to the good stuff. So she returns to the hive. She was successfully mated. Give her about two to five days and she will start laying eggs after that. And as I said, she can choose whether she's laying a fertilized or an unfertilized egg. If she comes up to a cell, she will measure it with her four legs, turn around, and based on the size of the cell, deposit a fertilized egg or an unfertilized egg. Now, new beekeepers always want to find the queen. And although that's really exciting when you find your queen, you certainly don't need to. What do you need to be able to do? You need to be able to see eggs to know that that queen has been in there on this frame within the last 24, 48, 72 hours. You would be able to see that by the eggs that are there. So each hive really in what they do could be considered a super organism. They carry out biological functions almost like a mammal. They respire, there is respiration, air circulates through the hive. They thermal regulate, they keep the inside of the hive at a temperature where they can incubate eggs when it's going to be like it is here tomorrow. We're gonna to drop down and our high tomorrow is gonna to be 20, something like that. I don't know, cold. Our bees are raising brood right now. 
So they will be keeping that hive at about 91 degrees right over the brood area. They make collective decisions about things like swarming and reproduction, when to raise a queen. They have all of those systems within the hive. This swarm that's over here on the hive right was one that Steve caught. The homeowner called us, it was huge, sent us this picture. And this swarm, of course, right off the ground. And besides the fact that it's great big, it was like, yeah, I'll be out there to get it. Well, Steve went out the next morning to get it. Overnight, it was an April swarm. Overnight, it snowed. And I wish he'd had a picture, had a camera. He doesn't, doesn't do cell phones much. There wasn't a camera. There was snow on the mantle of this swarm. And they were just fine. So Steve's going to talk about some of the next part of this. We have... Uh, we do a little division of labor in our beekeeping, not a lot, but we do most things together. We're going to talk about what you need to get started. Why Langstroth? We saw some interesting hives this morning. Langstroth, as uh, Kristen mentioned, you know, been around for 150 plus years and the hives are almost unchanged from that time. Yes, they are heavy, but part of the reason that they're unchanged is because, excuse me, is because they're very, very successful. So we generally try to encourage beekeepers to begin with Langstroth type equipment because it is the easiest to learn on and you will find the most correct information about it. Um, our beekeepers that have used, for instance, the top bar hives have a very difficult time being successful around us because of our tremendous weather swings. It's just a hard hive to, to, keep, to keep going. You can't, I'm not saying you can't, it's just harder. So that's why we use Langstroth. And when to start? The time is now. If you want to begin beekeeping this year, Now's the time to get your equipment going. So Steve's going to talk about the equipment of the hive. Trip buses. You can trip buses. Yes, uh, Langstroff equipment is has been uh, like Becky said around for 150 years. Uh, it was actually developed in the United States by a, a, a Pennsylvania preacher. Uh, but within a year or two, either direction of when he discovered. Uh, be, what we call bee space and uh, removable framed hives. It was also discovered in France, Switzerland, and Germany. And, and, and so, uh, and of course they, they claim to be the first ones to have removable framed hives just as we do. Uh, let's, let's to start off with, just go through the basic parts of the hive, talk about some of the terminology so that you're calling the right parts the right things. We sent to Ryan two documents for this talk. One of them was this blow up of the hive that, or the breakdown to show you kind of hive construction and that part of it. The second one was a document, I'll try to remember to talk about its resources and beekeeping. But if, if you didn't get this, let us know, we can send it to you. But this is a, particularly if you wanna build any of your equipment yourself really important to have. Uh, we'll, we'll build this kind of like a house. We'll start with foundation or, or the hive stand. It, it's what the, uh, the, the whole Langstroth system sets on to keep it up out of the dirt uh, and the mud. And so rain doesn't splash on it and, and your wood will stay solid. Uh, first thing is a bottom board. That's what your brood supers set on or your deep supers or, or brood supers, there's where the, they're the nine and uh, five eighths boxes that all the activity in the hive takes place in. It's where the winter food stored, where all the pollen stored, it's where the brood is reared. And in Kansas, we typically run uh, two, of these, two of these deep boxes, set one on top of each other. And inside of those boxes uh, is, is foundation. Uh, it's it's a top bar, bottom bar, two sidebars, and in the middle uh, we put a piece of, of uh, foundation that gives the bees kind of a pattern to draw cells the right size. They don't need it; they can completely do it without it. But it, it gives uh, some some physical support for the the, the wax. Uh, 
establishes the proper bee space and uh, it, it, it makes things just a lot easier for the bees. And there's lots, of, there's several different kinds of foundations. Uh, the old tried and true is, is wired wax foundation. Uh, it takes a little specialized equipment. It takes a jig, uh, some, uh, and, and wire and pliers and thumb or little, little brads. Uh, the bees like it the best, uh, but time is valuable to a lot of people. And uh, to sit around and, and, and do 10 hives worth of wired, wired wax foundation, you're probably gonna have a week in it. So uh, the plastic embossed foundation with the cell size embossed in the plastic and it's coated with a thin coat of beeswax is what nearly all of the beekeepers use today. It pops into the frame, uh, super easy to change out. And uh, the neat thing about it is if for some reason uh, uh, the bees don't draw it right, you can take your hive tool and scrape it off and make them do it again uh, with wired wax foundation. If they eat a hole in it, a lot of times they won't, they won't repair, repair the hole. Uh, there's another product that uh, I don't know if you can get it or not. It's what we started with years ago. It's called Duragill. And it has a plastic midrib with a thin piece of wax on each side of it that's impregnated with the cell size. And uh, it, it works good if you've got a strong honey flow going on and the bees are concentrating on building wax. Uh, but if you don't, they'll get bored and they'll eat the wax off and leave the plastic exposed in the middle and they absolutely won't draw it back. There are specialty uh, foundations too. Thin surplus foundation goes in your shallow supers for uh, uh, production of comb honey. It's edible, it's, it's uh, not wired in, it's held in by support pins or it's, it's hung from the top bar and gravity kind of keeps it straight. Uh, there's a new, pr new product on the market that's a drawn thin synthetic, synthetic foundation that uh, I've been experimenting with a little bit. I'm, I'm uh, kind of excited about it. Uh, uh, it's a little expensive, but if you pull frames out to maybe relieve some stress on a hive that is uh, in, in you, you're thinking is gonna swarm, you can put drawn foundation back in and it'll give the, the queen something to immediately lay on. Uh, it, you know, it might have other purposes too, like in uh, building nuke boxes or something, I don't know, but uh, it, it's uh, relatively new on the market. And then there's uh, foundationless uh, wax and, and uh, it's, been around for a long time and it basically Kristen talked about it. Kristen oh okay story. Kristen talked about it evidently but it's it's a thin strip and let the bees draw their own wax and uh keep it in uh line with the frame axis as as kind of boundaries of where it's it's going to be drawn at uh the next thing that as you're building up is a queen excluder and it has uh uh, a specific purpose. It keeps uh, the queen from moving up and laying eggs in your honey supers, uh, which you don't want. Uh, once the honey super's been laid in, uh, it's hard to uncap. And it also, uh, when the new bee hatches out, it leaves behind a microscopically thin cocoon that is protein and it's an attractant for wax moths and small hive beetles. So if you can keep the queen out of your uh, honey supers, uh, they store, they just store a lot better and, and uh, they extract a lot better too. Uh, your honey supers come in uh, uh, a shallow super that's uh, uh, five and about three quarters inches deep. Uh, it'll hold roughly between 25 and 30 pounds of honey. Uh, your, your medium supers are, or what we call Illinois supers are uh, about six and a quarter, six and a half inches deep. And uh, they will hold one that's completely full. And I've, I've weighed one at, in our class every year for the students to see will hold uh, between 33 and 37 pounds of honey. Uh, the, uh, on top of that, you have a, a, a inner cover that, that, has the ventilation ports in it. It has a hole in the middle for a porter bee scape that you might want to use to help get bees out of your supers. And uh, uh, then on top of that is your uh, telescoping cover that uh, protects the whole 
high from from the weather and uh, uh, the 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 top cover may be you know if, uh, commercial beekeepers what we use what we call a migratory cover that is is flat and doesn't have anything that holds that hangs over the side of the hive and that's that's mainly to keep uh, the hives that are are moved on pallets so that they'll they can uh, butt right up against each other in in hauling and in stacking and and uh, it's more for uh, uh, pollination contractors than backyard beekeepers. How to get your bees? That's uh, that's kind of the next question. You got you got your equipment all assembled and ready, and and now's the time of the year to be doing that because you don't want to be caught uh, uh, with with a package that's ready to be picked up and your equipment didn't put together. You're going to be in trouble. <laughs> that's just that's just uh, kind of long and short of it. Uh, package bees is probably the most uh, popular way to get bees in our part of the country. Uh, they come in uh, uh, a box about the size of a shoe box, a little taller, it's screened on both sides. It has a food can in it and it has the queen hanging in there in a little box on a wire on, on the top. Uh, usually it's three pounds of bees and uh, you're starting from, from bare bones scratch with this. It's uh, an invaluable tool in learning. Uh, it shows you how a colony starts from, from day one and uh, if you're willing to get into your bees and look, they, I guarantee you, they'll teach you more about beekeeping than you can ever learn out of a book. It's just uh, uh, fascinating to watch them uh, start drawing wax, uh, establish a brood area and how the colony will grow. Uh, a nucleus colony is, is another popular way to get started. And it usually is five uh, frames of bees and brood with a laying queen, uh, a frame of food, maybe a frame of honey, uh, but but uh, a colony. It 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 is just it's it just a colony that's a small colony, and it, it'll grow like a demon uh, when you, when you put it in into your uh, equipment. And uh, but it has it it has a uh, uh, downfall too. You have to know what you're buying. You have to know uh, how reputable the person you're getting it from is. You have to know. Uh, what good equipment looks like, what poor equipment looks like. You have to know Disease. your bee diseases so that, that you can look at the frames and say, well, these bees are loaded with mites or, well, we've got some chalk brood in this colony or, you know, this doesn't look right. And, you know, for most new beekeepers, that's something that they're not gonna be experienced enough in to do. Uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna condemn nukes as being bad to get because if you take somebody that is an experienced beekeeper they can really help you out in, in, in uh, uh, saying, yeah, these, these are good bees. It looks good, good brood pattern that you're not gonna be familiar with, but uh, that hopefully they'll look over your shoulder and say, this is what you're looking for uh, in buying a nuke. Established colonies, very rarely do established colonies come up for sale. And it's usually the result of a, uh, an old beekeeper that's uh, retired, the hives might've been neglected uh, again, uh, you have to know what you're looking for. It's uh, uh, buyer beware and uh, uh, that's where experience really comes in handy. And, and if you don't have that experience, find somebody that does uh, because like, like Jim Kelly out, said out in Western Kansas, uh, he bought and paid for every problem he ever had. And uh, swarms, swarms are a good way to catch bees. Uh, usually if a hive swarms, it's a healthy hive. Uh, sick hives just don't swarm. Uh, the, only, the only thing with a, a swarm is there might be the possibility of a mite load and that can be easily treated with a, uh, an oxalic acid drench before any brood is reared. Uh, they draw wax like demons and if it's an early prime swarm, uh, they'll make as much honey as any production hive you've got online and, and draw you new wax at the same time. Again, uh, have your equipment ready and uh, have, have a box ready that in case you get a swarm call and you, you, you'll have a place to put them. This is something I don't recommend, but I guarantee you, if you're a beekeeper, you're gonna try it one time, uh, is to trap bees out of a tree or try to remove uh, a colony from uh, a house. Uh, it's not worth it. Uh, I've done it, I've done it more than once. I guess I'm a slow learner. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of liability involved. Uh, 
and especially if they're in a tree, it's a valuable, valuable resource because those den hives, as I call them, swarm every year. And you can, in the, in the very bottom center picture, you can see a uh, swarm trap. It's, I've got wedged in a, a tree and uh, you can put some uh, drawn frames in it without any, without any food or anything that, and, and the bees will find it. And uh, you can catch a, a colony out of that every year. It's just, it's just like a chink. I mean, that, that they, uh, that they'll find it and uh, it's a very good resource and you'd really don't want to destroy it. Okay, you're gonna need a little bit of other equipment too. Uh, smoker, as Becky said that uh, the smoke masks the fear pheromone that the guard bees put out that calls the rest of the colony to action to uh, uh, defend itself. Uh, and, you, and your smoker does this. Uh, your smoker fuel can be, I like burlap, jute, punky wood, wood chips, wood pellets, pine needles. There's lots of commercial commercial fuel available. Uh, some, and all cotton material doesn't work too bad. Anything that's natural that will make smoke will probably work, but don't use anything synthetic or any petroleum products. Wood, wood chips really work good. And I found that uh, you can make some really nice stringy smoker fuel by turning a, a log on its side and, and, and cutting it uh, with the grain with a chainsaw and you can make, you can make a bushel basket full of it in about a minute. You're gonna need some uh, safety equipment. Uh, always wear a veil. It's uh, one, one of the things that we, we preach to our students and preach to our students. You don't wanna get stung on, in the eye or have one crawl down your ear and sting you or up your nose. Uh, it smarts. And, and, uh, but wear as much clothing as you, you need so that you feel comfortable. And you may, you may end up looking for the first few times you work your, your bees, uh, like the Michelin tire man out there completely covered up. But if that's what it takes for you to feel comfortable so you can comfortably look at frames, get into the hive, take it apart, uh, see what's going on and, and learn from it. Uh, if that's what it takes for you to feel comfortable, no big deal. Anthropomorphism. Uh, Becky's going to talk about that. <laughs> I think it's on a roll sometimes. So Dr. Marian Ellis, University of Nebraska, says anthropomorphism is the biggest obstacle to good beekeeping. He could be right. He's right about a lot of things. Your bees will not get to know you. You will learn to understand your bees. Your bees are not domesticated animals. There's almost no genetic difference between your bees and those living in a tree. Bees should be considered livestock and it is your responsibility to care for them as you would other stock, uh, feed them, medicate them, house them. I had a conversation this week with um, a woman who was like, well, the bees are in trouble. I wanna help the bees. Can I just put a box of bees in my garden? I don't want to harvest any honey for them, but it will provide them a place to live. And the answer is you'd be doing them a very big disservice. And the reason why is we also have, they, our honeybee is a non-native species to our area, and they have a whole lot of non-native predators as well. And the varroa mite and the other diseases and pests that will attack them will kill your colony usually within one to three years without intervention, without being cared for. There are some colonies that swarm and things happen and that they seem to coexist better with the mites than others, but generally it's, it's not good. As Kristen talked about, uh, you can be doing lots of right things and still have an incredibly high mite load. So- And you're making a varroa ball. If, and as Steve said, you're making a varroa bomb. If you leave these bees untended and they're gonna fend for themselves and they're gonna do what they need to do, then you are also likely creating something that, that lots of beekeepers call a varroa bomb. That hive will eventually abscound, leave because of the stress of the diseases. And when they do, they will go to other hives and they will then come into these other hives 
and bring the varroa mites, the diseases, and spread those among healthy bees. So it really is a problem for untended bees. So best practice scientific beekeeping. Beekeeping is an art and a science, and the science is your applied bee biology. And the art is understanding the floral sources in your region and then timing the growth of your bee population so that it will maximize honey production from that source. Our primary flower for producing honey is clover, white and yellow sweet clover. Trying to get our bee population to that place at the right time is our goal. If we get our population really high too soon, they swarm and our honey crop, we don't make a honey crop because then our population is very small. If we wait too long, all we do is grow bees for the season and don't produce any honey. We produce and sell honey. We make some skincare products that go along with that. We sell at a local market. So I sent, and I hope it got to everyone that wanted it or had the access to it, a document that's called Resources for Better Beekeeping. This document is just full of information about where you can learn about keeping bees. There is a plethora of things written about keeping bees on the internet. And I wish all of it was accurate and good for our area. Beekeeping is pretty regional and what works for somebody in Alaska or in Texas is certainly not the same thing that's gonna work for people here in Kansas and Nebraska. So you need to know. This is my favorite uh, honeybee biology textbook. It's written like a textbook. It has questions at the end of each chapter to kind of think about. It was written by uh, Dewey Karen and Larry Connor, two fabulous speakers. If you have a chance to hear either one of them, they're really enjoyable. This is about my favorite book, but there are many good books, including Beekeeping for Dummies, that you can educate yourself with. On the resources page, I've also listed several that are free. The one that's on the left, Beekeeping Basics, is done by uh, Penn State and the Merrick people, M-A-A-R-E-C, Mid-Atlantic something something, I don't remember. Everything they do is excellent. It's a free download. It's an excellent resource. The one in the middle, uh, Field Guide to Honeybee Diseases and Their Maladies, um, just great pictures of any disease that the bees can, that you are likely to see and a whole lot of them you are likely not to see. You can buy it as a field guide. It's about a $15 little pocket guide book, but you can also download it. And then the pictures are in color and big and pretty and you can look at it really well. The Honeybee Health Coalition is the last, um, uh, there's several freebies that you can download on that resources guide, but it's the Honeybee Health Coalition, um, Dewey Karen, same guy, is also involved in writing a lot of their material. They are the resource for varroa management. And as one of our recent speakers said, we really don't need to teach honeybees any longer. What we need to take is varroa mite management. That's what we should all be teaching because the varroa mite is just that important and that deadly. So, Opportunities. The Northeast Kansas Beekeepers Association, we meet twice monthly now by Zoom, the first and third Monday of each month. The first one is just a question and answer time. You can send in your questions, you can write them in the chat box, you can call whatever you'd like to do, and you'll get your questions answered. The third is a planned program meeting. Membership is $15 for a whole year and includes a wonderful newsletter. Cheryl Burkhead's been on this um, program today and she is our editor. She does a great newsletter. Check out our website, nekba.org. The Kansas Honey Producers is also an association in our state, represents beekeepers from all over the state. Our meeting right now is also going to be held via Zoom. It will be March 5th. We will have speaker uh, Dr. Sam Ramsey and many more. Excellent program. You can see the whole details, kansashoneyproducers.org. I am the current president of the Kansas Honey Producers, and so I might be a little bit biased, but I think it will be an excellent program. Jolie Weiner is our program chair, and she does a great job of finding us interesting, interesting speakers. This is us, 
And as I said, we've been doing this a while and we find now that kind of our favorite things to do is teach. So we teach a lot of beekeeping. We teach beekeeping at Shawnee North Community Center and when good people like the KRC ask us to do it. So I bet we have time for a few questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Becky and Steve. Um, regarding your uh, handouts that you sent, um, there's one at least uploaded in Whova that you can either find in the agenda on this session, uh, if you scroll down, or just in Whova in the documents folder. The other one I didn't find, and I might have missed it in my email somewhere, I'm sorry, but we, um, we will send out an email later, um, either this weekend or here shortly, when we have all the recorded sessions uploaded again, so you can view any of them that you want to. And I'll try to include um, links or copies of all these different resources in that email as well. So you'll get it. I don't know exactly where it is right now, the other one, but um, yeah. And if I were smarter, I could probably put it in the chat box and people could grab it, but that's not one of my good skills. So I probably would be better off to send it to you and then have people get it from you. Or you can email me. My email was on there, bstbs at Embark Mail. I'd happy to send it out individually to anybody. That would be good too. Mm -hmm. um, I did while you were talking, I put some links here in the chat so you can find Country Creek Honey on Facebook. Um, and I also put the Northeastern Kansas Beekeepers Association and the honey producers in there. There's also a list KRC made back in 2017 of all the honey um, and beekeeping groups in Kansas or the, the big Ooh, official ones. Very uh, good. So there's a number of them throughout the state. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, Northeast Kansas and probably South Central are the biggest ones, but um, there are others all around too. So a um, couple questions. Um, are... Uh, Apis mellifera, the main bee that makes honey. Apis mellifera is the main, the, it, that is the honey bee uh, that we use. They, Apis mellifera linguista refers specifically to the Italian honey bee. And that's honestly, people ask us, what, well, what, what kind of bees do you guys have, Becky? We have mutt bees. We have bees that are, we should, they're all Americans. I don't know what they are. They're just mutt bees. And so we've raised them uh, long enough that they're bees that are successful in our area. That's it. And but, that's uh, it. And, and worldwide, there are other, uh, there are other species. Apis dorsetta, it's, a, it's the giant uh, Asian bee. Uh, Apis serrana, it's the bee that uh, is able to coexist with mites. Uh, Apis florea is a stingless bee that has a vertical uh, or a horizontal comb. Uh, it produces honey, but not surplus honey like Apis mellifera does. So you might get a cup, maybe. Yeah, uh, yeah. So worldwide, there there are several species besides Apis mellifera that that operate with you know that are flower feeders that operate in the same parameters that our bees do. Thank you. Um, uh, Mark asked where, when they're doing uh, the, the honeybee dance, where do they do it? Inside the hive or outside the hive or both? Inside the hive. So they're dancing and they can dance. On the face of the frame. On the, they dance on the face of the frame. So you've got these little frames and they're dancing on that frame and their dance tells direction and distance and the quality of the nectar by this, by how excited they dance. And they do the circle dance if it's close. They do the waggle dance if it's a little further. Um, just really remarkable, but yes. It, figure eight. Yeah, yeah. Inside, in the dark, on this frame and in relationship to the sun. And so that they can do all, this. so yeah, more math than I can do. <laughs> there are some really neat videos out there of, of scientists exploring that and, and kind of trying to figure out how they how they communicate that all. Um, in the spring, do you replace the frames in the deep that the bees overwintered in? They have found that with our bee diseases and with the incredible pressure from chemicals that it's more important than ever to have um, clean frames. But the recommendation now is someplace between every three and five years. Your, it takes eight times the energy 
to build wax, to build frames as it does to produce an equal quantity of honey. Pound of beeswax, pound of honey, a lot more energy to build beeswax. And so keeping that wax carefully, making sure that you have the best use of it is really important. But three to five years is kind of the time frame that you should probably try to rotate those out of your production for health reasons. And uh, the beekeeper can, can tell a lot of times, uh, of course, as, as the, the, the foundation ages, it turns darker. But one of the things to look for is in the center of the brood area, when the cells lose that octagon shape or hexagon shape, uh, and, and start to look around and the cell walls thicken, uh, they'll thicken to a place where the queen won't lay in them or, or diminish in size and, and then uh, uh, in, a, in a confined cavity like that uh, where they can't build any more new wax, the colony will abscound. Now this, that's gonna take many years. It's way more years, yeah. Many years, yeah. but, but uh, uh, thickening of the cell size and the color of the wax. And of course you keep records too, so you should know how, how old this wax is and, and be thinking about, you know, maybe necessary, it's necessary to replace it. Uh, if it's a year old and for some reason you're calling it, say it starved over the winter and the bees are, are dead with their heads down in the cells, uh, that can be cleaned out and, and a new package installed or a swarm installed in it. So, you know, uh, you're, you're just that much ahead on, on, on trying to reestablish a colony. It's a it's a weight between production efficiency and and health of the of the hive. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, what tasks do you think a beekeeper beekeeper should take in the spring? What are some of the main tasks that in this period coming up? Spring is is the most active active time for beekeepers. Um, evaluate first is the strength of the hive, the quant, the how much brood you have, how vigorous this queen is, whether she lived, whether she died. <laughs> so I mean, it really is in, I love spring inspections because you go out and it's, um, you just never know what you're going to see. And that first time you open the hive, you open it up and you've got eight big frames of brood and it's like, holy moly, I need to split these guys because they're gonna, you know, just pop any minute or you open the hive and you have um, a three inch circle of brood and you kind of go, oh, well, I've got to do something to get these guys so that they're going to make it till I can do something else with them. So that early spring inspections, uh, we usually feed in the spring if they need some feed, we'll do that. Uh, also feeding one-to-one -one syrup is stimulating so that if you uh, start, if you want to split hives, if you want to raise more bees, you can feed them a little bit of one-to-one -one syrup and get that kind of get them going. It mimics um, a nectar flow so that they will start raising brood a little, little more vigorously. Uh, typically, uh, we, do, we do a lot of equalize, equalizing on our colonies that the first week in April, I like to have the queen laying on three frames in the colony. And generally that means when I get in there, as Becky said, you may have every place from queen laying on one frame to the queen laying on seven or eight frames. Well, uh, you've got a situation where she's laying on more than three, you've got the opportunity to pull out, pull out frames of bees and brood, uh, introduce a new queen, make a nuke or uh, put it in another box, make a split, but uh, Three frames, the first week in April, that buildup should pretty much put that colony on track to take advantage of our white Dutch clover and our yellow sweet clover flow when it starts to come on uh, last part of May, first week or so in June and on into the summer. Now that is, it, beekeeping is so regional. That is Northeast Kansas. Uh, I saw Jim Kelly on here a little bit ago. He's from Larned. His talk is a different talk. That is, he does, it, when you talk different about time frame, sources, yes, time frame. It, it is very different. So it is very regional. How many forage acres uh, are generally good for a colony or how far will they uh, travel from the hive? Long way. Two miles. <laughs> That's what, 8,000 acres or something yeah, like that? 8,000 8, some acres. Uh, Two mile, anything over two miles is kind of a point of diminishing return where the bees will actually have to start using the nectar that they've collected in order to get back to the hive. Uh, 
but that that's not you know on 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 floral sources that are a long way from the hive the bees will actually load up with some nectar before they take off so they have the fuel to get there and back with with a a, a load of of uh new nectar uh but but uh, mo most of the uh resources are, are garnered within probably a mile of the hive but but two like I say two miles is kind of the point of diminishing return so what you plant for bees is is always important because it helps all pollinators helps the natives helps the the bees helps everything but thinking that your bees are going to produce their honey crop off of your fruit trees or off of your clover patch is probably not very accurate. That it may, it, it'll be good for somebody, but it's not going to be sufficient. It is all those other flowers. And that's one of the real reasons that Roundup has hurt the bees so much. It's not necessarily that Roundup itself, which is nasty, ha kills the bees. It's that it kills their food. All those little tiny bitty weeds that produce flowers what I, what I call green flowers that we, don't, we don't see the bees do yeah and and it, they just aren't there that's just just not there so um we have time for one or two more i need to start the next session pretty soon yep, Sorry, yep, yep. um we're done uh i live in a city i have a garden in my yard i'm worried there are too many people planting flowers covered in neon next for it to be healthy for the bees um should that be concerning it is somewhat concerning. I'm more concerned with people who decide that Japanese beetles are evil and they spray everything. Those are what we've lost most of our hives from with spray in the last few years is the Japanese beetle population explodes. And the next thing you know, we've lost three hives because somebody decided they were gonna rid the world of Japanese beetles. Or and grandma has two tomato plants and she treats them with a half a can of seven dust every year. That's probably the worst thing that, that, that uh, could happen to a beehive is have that within. Bees aren't really attracted to, to, with, to tomato plants, but uh, of course it gets strung around on everything else in the garden and then, then you're in trouble. All just, over the melons. Just a little bit of that goes a long way to wrecking a hive. We have a real good friend who keeps bees two blocks from Washburn University, Central Topeka. They do well unless he has a spray event and so I don't feel like the neonics for his are as big a problem but that his area has a lot of old established shrubs trees things like that that I think that they work so so I you know and, and it, it, city it, city bees can do well weather dependent if he gets a lot of moisture he's got a lot of white Dutch clover and he's made some good good honey crops yeah. with inside yeah. of the capital building <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes rates of spray in, in cities are at a higher concentration per area, definitely, than in agricultural areas, but you also have maybe a loss of diversity somewhat from so much monoculture. So there's there's the benefits and hazards in both areas. That that is exactly it. So if you don't get your questions answered, I would I answer emails. S shoot me an email, send me a message, be happy to do that. I'm on Facebook a lot with the NEKBA group. So happy, happy to help out that way. Is there another burning question or are we about done? I don't want to. I got it. I got to cut it. I'm sorry, Lisa. You can, you can email, um, you can email Becky and Steve, but uh, I got to get, get this next speaker ready. So thank you both so much. This has been Thanks, awesome. And, Thanks uh, for asking us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks everybody for attending and feel free to reach out to them or us if, uh, if you need anything else. So you got it. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah.